And our New Testament reading today is from the letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Uh, as a refresher, Paul, the apostle, was a uh, a mentor to many young men and others in ministry, and Timothy is one of them. Paul refers to Timothy as being his his son in Christ, uh, and so it was a close relationship, and he has many good things to say to Timothy. And so here are some general instructions about worship. Page number 924 in your pew Bible, if you wish to follow. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people, As you make your requests, plead for God's mercy upon them and give thanks. Pray this way for kings and all others who are in authority, so that we can live in peace and quietness, in godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, for he wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is only one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and people. He is the man Jesus Christ. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message that God gave to the world at the proper time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In thinking this week about this service, I was reflecting on what is it in my experience that makes me particularly proud or pleased to be Canadian or grateful and thankful to be Canadian. And I came up with a lot of things, but for me, my greatest Canadian moment, my greatest delight as a Canadian came on June the 1st, 2017, when I got to do what I think, in, in my experience, has been the most meaningful thing I've done so far in my life. And that was to pick up this lovely family, as well as Russia, and to welcome them from their hometown of Homs on the bottom right, blown up and destroyed and obliterated, to Canada. A land where I could guarantee that never again would their son see someone beheaded and laying on the street. A land where I knew never again would their children wake up screaming in terror because of bombs. A land where I knew they would be welcomed, they would be able to flourish, they would have a new life. And as we got to know them, and as I got to know them, and as they became not just my friends, but my family, and as they started to refer to me as sister and aunt, it became clear that when you are in a situation like the Al Shares, you are delighted to find out you're going anywhere. But when you find out that you're coming to Canada, it's like winning the lottery. Because it is a land with a reputation for flourishing and wellness and goodness and wholeness and peace. And it is a place that others very much desire to live. And to see the children grow and heal, and they're a lot bigger than that now. I couldn't find, they're actually such a busy family. I couldn't find a picture where they were all in one spot that a kid wasn't like doing this or sticking out their tongue or crying or, you know. But it was the most beautiful experience because never in my life have I been given such an opportunity to stop and reflect on how blessed I am that I was just born here that I didn't have to do anything to get here. I just am here. And it is such a blessing, and one that I hope all of us will feel more fully. And so I got wondering, as those of us who have just been here, who grew up here, who were born here, and those who have come and and live here and, and integrated here, how proud are we to be Canadian? Because I can tell you, they are thrilled, looking forward to the day when they can become citizens. They have been almost here long enough, and their English proficiency is almost high enough that by next summer they should be able to be citizens. So I got wondering, well, how proud are we to be Canadian? So, of course, I found an infographic, because that's what I do. And it turns out that 87% of Canadians over the age of 15 are proud to be Canadian. Good. 
90% feel a strong sense that they belong in Canada. That's a good thing. Uh, seniors are most likely to be proud to be Canadian. There you are. Uh, oh, 63% of women and 59% of men are proud to be Canadian. Uh, and our top three primary sources of pride are our Canadian history, the armed forces, and universal health care. Three cheers. Hooray for universal health care. <laughs> There is so much about Canada that is worth celebrating, and I know that if I stopped and I asked you for examples, you would come up with some too. But then I also thought, if we're really proud to be Canadian, but 13% of us aren't sure, what are issues that we are worried about as Canadians? Because, you know, we have that universal and global reputation for being caring and compassionate and kind. So I thought, well, what is it that we're worried about? So I sought that out. It turns out that the areas of greatest concern to Canadians are ones that I've heard some of you express. Concerns about the affordability of housing or lack of. Concerns about the wages and cost of living the gap between the rich and the poor, and other issues like clean drinking water. That is water from a tap on a reserve in Canada. Child poverty rate of 14%, an environmental crisis in the north. While we are proud to be Canadian, and while the Alshares are right that this is a good land in which to live, we recognize that no land is perfect because it is made up of and led by humans. And at times we do things that are selfish or wrong or careless. And so as we celebrate Canada Day weekend and reflect on that this morning, we will also stop and pray. We have that line in our, our, our anthem, God keep our land, right? But we will pray that we will be a land that is kept far more than just glorious and free. That we also become, as the Bible calls us to be, a land that is just and righteous and equitable and welcoming and many other things. As I mentioned earlier, the, na the relationship between church and state in many places and in many times has been difficult and no less so in Canada. We do not officially have a separation of church and state, but we practically do. And I think that in many ways that is good. In the 50s, recognizing that there was this tension of, of being Canadian, but also being Christian, and where does our loyalty most lie, and how do, we, how do we live as Canadians and as Christians, and all of those things, and what's the role of the church, and what's the role of the state, and how should they work together, and should they work together, especially as the, our denomination wrestled with some of those things around residential schools and the stuff that we talked about last week. They came up with this document, the Declaration of Faith Concerning Church and Nation, and I am not going to read it all to you because I like you. <laughs> but I'm going to paraphrase it for you. In that document as Presbyterians, we're reminded that Jesus Christ is above all things, that he is not only the head of the church, but as part of the Trinity, he is the head of all things, that Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit have power and dominion over both the church and all nations, including ours. And it is his desire to use them both in different and unique ways. As the church, we know we are called to serve him, to proclaim his word boldly, to administer the sacraments, which are signs of his grace that we experience together, to live out our faith, and to work from a place of love. His desire and an intention for the state, for the nation of Canada, in our case, is that it will administer his justice and benevolence that it will discern and create and enforce laws and policies that promote the well-being of all of its citizens and work to avoid discord within the nation. This declaration, the existence of this policy, reminds us that every level of power in the nation, cultural and political and religious and economic, can only properly function when it is being obedient to God's word and the ways of his kingdom. And we know that that often isn't the case. We see that. We pray about that. We worry about that. We talk about how to live in the midst of that. 
And while we might have overlapping concerns, while we care for the poor and the nation is to care for the poor, while we want justice and the nation is to want justice, there is to be a differentiation between us. Neither one is supposed to overtake the other. But most importantly in this declaration of church and nation is the reminder that one of the primary ways that the church can be involved in ministry in its na our nation is to engage in what's called intercession, praying on behalf of and praying for those in authority and for the nation itself, praying that the overruling power of the Holy Spirit will bring into fruition what's good and uproot what's evil in our national life and in our international interactions. This idea of praying for those in authority above us, particularly civil leaders, is found throughout scripture in many passages. In 1 Timothy that I read this morning, Timothy, the older and more experienced man in faith, is speaking to his protege, his, his son in the faith, Timothy. And he tells him that it is important above all to be praying for one another in worship. And he uses here four different Greek words, all in about one sentence. We translate it as, above all, pray for all people. But it actually would be, if we took the, the Greek like word for word-ish, <laughs> above all, pray for, appeal for a particular need, make petitions, boldly request, and express gratitude for all people. There is this sense in which praying for one another is a fourfold thing. We, we speak about particular needs. We make petitions often. God, please be involved. God, please direct. God, help us to. God, show us what, these petitions. And we do it urgently and boldly, knowing that there is nothing that prevents us from coming to God with these requests, and we express gratitude that he hears them. But starting with this general pray for all people, Paul instantly goes, and then, once you've sort of prayed for all people, hone in on the leaders, the ones in authority. He pulls out the kings and others who are in authority, because if we're going to pray for our nation— it's logical that we have to start with the people at the top who rule and lead it on our behalf. Now, in the context of Paul and Timothy, they are praying for the leaders so that they can have a quiet and peaceable life, Timothy says, where they can live with godliness and dignity. We want the same things. And their ability to do that determined, was determined by the patience or the attitude of the Roman Empire at the time. But it's also instructive that he is saying to pray for them and not to them. Because in the context when Paul wrote this to Timothy, it was common to pray to Caesar because he was seen as being God. There certainly wasn't in the mindset of the time a separation between the two. But because there is for us, we hear in this, these verses the encouragement that we will pray for leaders recognizing, as he says in the following verses, that there is only one God and head of all things, and that is Christ. And so recognizing the authority of Christ and that he is above all and can use all things and all situations, we pray for our nation and our leaders, asking that God would be active in changing and transforming, in bringing about his will. Psalm 72, which shows up, that line from sea to sea, shows up in our uh, national language and creed. In Psalm 72, whoops, that's not what I wanted yet. <laughs> in Psalm 72, we are likewise advocated, uh, or it likewise advocates for and encourages us to pray for our leaders as representatives of the nation. And in fact, that whole psalm deals with prayers for the king, right? So this week I got wondering how often we stop and pray for our leaders. I found this because I thought it was kind of funny. It's going to be a long 10 months. It's obviously written in January. 
But I've been wondering, what if, I, you know, I had mentioned when I came back from that Presbyterian pastor's retreat in Puna Canada that I'm trying to spend more time at like Tim Hortons or Green Bean just listening to what people are talking about. People really complain a lot about politicians and about our country. That's what I'm learning. And still, the Tim Hortons in Hanover is widely fascinating, the new one. So I got thinking as I listened to a couple of guys uh, about minute 35, still grousing about a particular Trudeau, um, <laughs> I got wondering, man, what if, what if we took all of the time that we spent complaining about our prime minister or our MP, now he gets a little bit he gets a little bit, or, or our, our premier, he gets a little bit better fare at the Tim Hortons, but not much. Or our MPs or our MPPs or our mayor. What if we took all of that time societally, or even as the church, that we spend complaining about those people and instead offered up intensive prayers for them and for their leadership and for, the, and for God to work in and through them? And what if we did that in equal proportion? What might the effect be on our nation, or on our mindsets, or on our society? The Anglicans, God bless them, prescribe as part of their weekly worship prayers for the Queen and others in authority. Perhaps we should consider doing likewise. But then I got thinking, all right, so if we took all that time, and instead of complaining about the politicians, we prayed for them, what would we pray? What would our objective be? I mean, we could pray for, like, wild military success, although that wouldn't be my prayer. We could pray for a booming and thriving economy, or the quelling of all political dissension, or the, or the greatness of our nation to be known. But what is it that God would have us pray for? And Psalm 72 answers that, but the answers are very different. Psalm 72 demonstrates to us that we are to pray that our leaders will treat the poor with justice. And justice is not just fairness or the good being rewarded and the wicked being punished. But in the biblical sense, justice is almost subversive because it shows God's desired state of affairs when the poorest are cared for and the wealthy don't complain about it, when the last are first and the first are last. A society is just to the degree to which every person has enough and is lifted up. In the Old Testament, the kings that are seen as good are not the ones with the most chariots or the biggest treasury, but the ones who in wisdom ruled, seeking God's leadership, caring for the poor, and defending the needy. Because that is the other thing that we are told. We are to pray that our leaders will help us as a nation to defend the cause of the poor and the fatherless, to crush oppressors and deliver those in need. And that they will do this so that righteousness and peace will abound. And here again, righteousness is not just a, a shallow word. It's not just a goodness, but it's being in sync with God's ways and embodying his will. These are the ways that we are to pray for our leaders and our nations, that we will be leaders who, that we will be a nation who, because of our love of God, or for many, in spite of our love of God, will still do the will of God, which is to ensure that all flourish, that this land is glorious and free for all people. These are two ancient scripture passages, and they are written in an ancient political context. But the designs of God that shout from these verses are throughout all of scripture and echo across the centuries. And they raise hard questions for us as the church today. Do we believe that all authority truly belongs to God? And do we believe that prayer for those with earthly authority is necessary and can be effective. And if we answer yes to those, what are we going to do with these encouragements to pray for our leaders and for our nation? This would normally be the time in the sermon where I'd give you an application piece. But today we're going to do the application piece. Feeling strongly compelled by Scripture and my own understanding of the theology of church and state, which I have thought about a lot, 
and wrote a thesis on, if anyone's interested. (laughs) We are going to live out an application. We are going to pray in a very directed and intentional way for our leaders and for our nation. Because we are a nation that is loved by God, respected by the world, and in which we are all grateful to live, we are going to pray. We are going to intercede. We are going to come to God on behalf of our nation with requests. And so here is what's going to happen. I am going to start, and I will give a general sentence about who or what we are praying for. There will be a moment of silence or two for you to make personal prayer about that issue or individual. Then I'll say a collective, I will say a line, and at the end of that, we'll all say together, Oh Lord, hear our prayer. It's on the screen. So, let's begin. Almighty and everlasting God, you are king and ruler over all things. There is no thing on this earth, there is no one in this world who does not exist because of your will and by your design. And there is no one or no thing that is above you or usurps you and your power. And recognizing that you are the king and ruler over all things, and recognizing that you have a plan and a call and a design for our nation, we, your people, humbly come together in prayer for our nation, and for our leaders. We ask that you would hear this prayer, that you would make us faithful in continually offering such prayers to you, and that in offering it, we would be confident in your ability to act. And so, Lord God, this morning we pray for our Prime Minister and for all of the MPs that serve in Ottawa and for our Premier and all of the MPPs that join him in Toronto. We pray, O Lord, that you will give to the leaders of our country and our province wisdom to seek what is right and the goodness to do it. O Lord, hear our prayer. And Father, we know that there are represented here among us, people from both Hanover and Brockton. And we think particularly this morning of Chris Peabody and Sue Patterson, our mayors, and for all those who serve on the councils in our municipalities. And we ask that you would direct them, that they would seek you. Hear our prayer for them. We pray, O Lord, that you will give the leaders of our municipalities the wisdom to seek what is best for the flourishing of all and not just for some, and the resolve to do these things. O Lord, hear our prayer. Father, we are a nation that has always been made up of those who come from away, from other places, and all of us trace our family's journey here in some capacity. And so this morning we think of immigrants and refugees and migrants who come to work here for a short time, and we offer these prayers for them. God of all nations, show us how to use our wonderful country for the benefit of people from all lands and to have hospitable hearts that welcome and include all people. O Lord, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, particularly as Presbyterians in Canada, we know the truth of the difficult relationship that has been had between our nation and our churches and our indigenous people, and of the journey of healing that continues to unfold. And so for the First Nations, Inuit and Métis, people of our nation, we offer these prayers. Healing God, we ask that you continue to bring healing and wholeness to indigenous communities. Bless them and increase our nation's commitment to journey with them. O Lord, hear our prayer. And Father, there are many men and women in this nation who volunteer to serve us and who we call and ask often to do very difficult things, sometimes at the expense of their own sense of humanity. 
And so we pray for all those enlisted in our armed forces and in the reserves, offering these prayers for them. Almighty God, we ask that you will protect those who have offered to serve on our behalf. Give them strength and courage and protect them and help us to support them adequately when they are injured physically, mentally, and emotionally. O Lord, hear our prayer. And finally, Lord, we pray for all Canadians, regardless of age or gender or race or socioeconomic status or any other category. We ask that you will continue to bless us as a nation. And so for all Canadians and for our nation as a whole, we offer these prayers. Loving God, we thank you that you will move in the hearts and lives. We ask that you will move in the hearts and lives of all Canadians, bringing our will and our priorities in line with those of your kingdom. Send into the hearts of each one the transforming power of your Holy Spirit, so that as a nation we might seek first service of you and then of one another. O Lord, hear our prayers. And now, Lord, hear us as we pray together the words that your Son Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.